and see the articular pillars here, and we're aiming for the, the sulcuses here on the different levels. Now, let's go, let's go north. Let's get there. And here we're at the C12 joint. And two and the C2 there. A nice sulcus in view of the actual articular pillar there. That's the target at the level of the skin here. Making sure you're staying lateral. Yeah, go ahead and get a lateral view. Thank you very much. And with, with the lumbar, but also cervical, especially uh, you're wanting to make sure you get a very good lateral. It takes a lot of manipulation and adjustments uh, at times to get the appropriate lateral. You want to, first of all, get a good sharp image of your discs. You're also wanting to make sure you get a view of the articular pillars and that they're also lining up the facet joints. Let's go uh, oblique towards you. Let's go that way towards you. Yeah. Live. And back towards me. A little more, a little more. Good there. Excellent. And sharpen up that articular pillar there. That's WAG. This way for me, live. Yep. Other way now. Good there. Stop there. Excellent. Lock it there for me. Thank you. But at times, yeah, the you have a bit of difficulty in getting at the, the appropriate lateral and it's taking your time and making sure you are obtaining a strong lateral. Approaching, as we saw in our AP view on the screen there, if you want to pan over to the, to the uh, imaging on the right of the screen. Can we get this picture of the uh, actual, uh, this uh, secondary screen? No, I, but um, what the picture on the right, so the, the audience can see the right. Uh, Too late. Okay. Yeah. Well, you just have to stop, swap, and peek at it, and then start back. Okay. So we're making sure we're staying lateral to the, the sulcus there. Or we could also go. To the yeah. Can you screw that camera? Yeah. Yeah. Can we go to the uh, third camera there, and sort of the C-arm um, camera, and focus in on the uh, fluoroscopy monitor?
My point is just making sure we're uh, staying lateral to that particular pillar, advancing slowly, walking off, and aiming for that centroid portion of the articular pillar. This particular is a straight needle. And we're manipulating in there. In that fashion. Good, good view. You want to stay away from the uh, particular framing. Um, and staying away, obviously, from the more medial areas. Uh, so you want to make sure you're, when you're advancing, you are advancing uh, and double checking with the AP views. Okay, let's go back to. Uh, so we would proceed with, uh, if we're doing a radio frequency ablation, we'd be ready now to uh, uh, test with uh, 50 hertz uh, for sensory. At talking to the patient and, uh, and seeing uh, what sensations, if they have any pain, light touch, pressure, uh, and you're communicating with the patient and, and seeing it's, it, it's uh, having it in the, right, in the right area. Here, as you see, we're in the uh, um, C, uh, C4 uh, articular pillar. Uh, after we do the sensory testing, we'd move on to the motor test and get two hertz, uh, looking for multifidus, uh, um, multifidus uh, activation and some twitching, of course, occurring in the uh, cervical musculature, as well as the patient uh, talking to you and asking if they are feeling that. Okay, uh, making sure that the patient's not having any uh, sensations occurring down their extremity, of course, uh, and then moving forward with uh, getting the uh, ablation done at uh, 80 degrees Celsius. Uh, approximately you know, 110 seconds um, for the a nerve ablation, okay? And then move forward with another level in particular. Uh, if you want to go to the actual more lumbar areas, well, we would transition over, we're going to go over and uh, Let's go to the lumbar, we're going to do with curved. Yeah. Get a picture of this thing. Thank you. Got two of those. We're going to transition to it for the lumbar region. And if you want to pan in on the, come to lift this up. Want to pan in on the actual uh, ablation uh, probes here. So we have an example of what I was talking about earlier of the monopolar uh, monopolar example of. Uh, Radio frequency ablation occurring. This is chicken meat. And a typical elliptoid type of uh, burn occurring. Okay. As you see here. But the capabilities of the Acurian device is that we're also able to provide a strip lesion. And whereas before we'd have the monopolar, uh, this can be switched over to act as a bipolar. So one of the needles acts as a cathode, and the other one acts as an anode. And therefore, you're providing a nice strip lesion uh, as well, which can be beneficial for uh, different types of burns, whether it be for the sacroiliac joint or knee genicular nerve block, uh, nerve ablations as well. Okay? And that's where they're enhanced, cooled type of technology. And we're talking about that in particular. If we're talking about some of their enhanced uh, devices and the probes for the actual device is that in terms of the probe itself, 
it acts as a bipolar. Therefore, it has an anode and cathode within it itself. In addition to that, it actually has a, it is cooling water to the tip of the probe. By doing so, it is any, the, the outer, the, the surface of the actual metal is cooled. And therefore, you're able to uh, have a larger uh, uh, lesion created by that because there's less dehydration and less charring occurring, therefore allowing for a larger volume lesion to occur. And that's the bipolar probe that they have in their enhanced capabilities with this type of Acurian. Can you grab those? They're going to fall off there. Thanks, Ben. So now we'll move forward with the actual uh, lumbar types of actual, uh, let's go back to AP, sorry. Medial branch neurotomies and the approach to take for those. And the imaging, again, is, is crucial in making sure you are burning to the correct area. So we have the lumbar five vertebral body, as we can see here. Uh, there we go, uh, lumbar five, at which we have the lumbar four medial branch located at the sulcus of the superior articular process right there and the transverse process. So the sulcus created in between them is where the medial branch is located, as Dr. DePinto was describing. But we can't just go ahead and go straight down the AP view. And the reason being is that the mammillary ligament is on our way if we do it in that fashion. So in order to get away from that ligament and get a, a good burn on the medial branch, we are going to go approximately anywhere from 15 to 25 degrees oblique, ipsilaterally uh, on that side. So we'll go live, 20 degrees or approximately. Oblique towards you, five, 20 degrees. Is that the 20, approximately? 20, 25? What's that now? 30, okay. Let's go to 20. Thank you very much. So in addition to that, so that's the medial branch. So now you're getting away from the actual mammary ligament. But we're looking at the primary dorsal ramus. OK. As you can see it here. Oh. Right there. It's, we lighten that up. Oh. That's pretty good. We lighten that up at right there. So that's where the primary L5, lumbar 5, uh, primary dorsal ramus is located, uh, created by the, the uh, secret ala and, and between the secret ala and the superior trichal process at S1, and the sulcus created by that. OK. So to get at that, we're looking at more of a decline view. The problem with going on the decline view at this angle is that if we did it in this angle and we're going after the, lumb the L5 primary ramus, the iliac crest will get in our way. So we wouldn't use it at this oblique angle, but we can get after the, PDO, uh, the medial branch, the L4 medial branch, and we would provide a decline view from here. Let's go, let's go, let's go approximately uh, from this angle. Uh, can we go about uh, 20 to 30 degrees, Caudal? Good. 
Do there. Thank you. So right here. Are the folks seeing uh, that one? Yeah, I'm trying to fix it. Because, yeah, it's pretty lit up. Unless they're seeing this picture here. I don't think they are, though. So we're going to try and see if we can uh, work on the uh, enhancement there. Yeah, let me take a picture of this instead. Can you go to the camera to that? Mm. We can move, it releases and it can move. That, uh, we're going to get the, uh, the monitor of the uh, fluorosity uh, online so we can see better the actual uh, imaging uh, because it's, it's just... Uh, Going out of focus there. That's a lot better. Thank you very much, Tyler. So, so we're going to be going after L4 middle branch at this point right here. And coming down right straight down the II. Good. A little bit of OS right there. Uh, now go to uh, lateral view. So we're, we're trying to get a lengthwise ablation of the nerve. So we would not come at it by coming at it this way. All right. So we're not trying to come at, come at the nerve by a pinpoint. We're trying to come at the nerve if this is the nerve. We're trying to come along the nerve, along the passage of the nerve, to get an excellent burn on the nerve. So when we look at the lateral, Right offhand, we know that we're not in full focus of a true lateral. And that's where we want to make sure of that to get, make sure we're not going into any areas too close to the foramen or even to the disc. So let's go, uh, let's wag it, the C arm. Thank you so much. Live. There. Excellent. Get a picture of the disc. Good view of the SAPs. Let's go oblique towards me live. Right. There, we're getting a strong lateral there. Oh, now the it's like this now. Uh, wag it for me. Thank you so much. And let's go north a little bit. We're trying to optimize the, ang the, the, the imaging as much as possible to get the right up there. Get a good view of the needle and making sure you have a good view of the anatomy. So, for the depth of the needle, you want to go with the base of the SAP about one third into the depth at the base of the SAP. I felt the, I'm walking off OS, going more right into the base of the SAP, one third into the base of the superior articular process. 
at which we would take out the stylet. Now test our sensory at 50 hertz, our motor at 2 hertz, checking for any multifidus contractions, and then also making sure the patient's not having any pain or contractions into the uh, lower extremity before providing your lidocaine or marcaine anesthetic and then providing your 110 second 80 degrees Celsius nerve burn. Okay? All right. Tyler, how much time do you have left? Yes. Good? Uh, yeah. You make up some time right now. Okay. All right. Any further questions? I'll turn it back to the lecture hall. Thanks, guys. No, no. Excellent. Are we on? No, on. Yeah, you're on. So we're going to move moving forward right to the uh, nerve ablations for the knee, the sacroiliac, and I believe the, just the knee, sorry. Yeah, and then if you want to hop over, maybe yeah. do a little Q&A just real yeah. quick, just like two or three minutes. Excellent. What's that have to see? James, was it tough to see the imaging? Yeah. You can see after all, after, after, but then you saw the screen is better, right? So, so yeah, we're just answering any particular questions that you guys may have. We're going to transition over and change the demonstration uh, over in the lab there. So stay tuned. So stay, so stay tuned. Uh, so stay tuned. We're going to be uh, moving forward with the uh, nerve ablation for the knee with Dr. Naidu. Answer some previous questions I know we had regarding uh, where you'd enter uh, if you had hardware. Could you enter higher uh, in the thoracic spine? Yes, you could. I demonstrated the lumbar area because that's a safer way to approach uh, spinal cord stimulation trials. You can, uh, if there is no hardware, there's nothing in your way, then it would be safer to do it in the mid lumbar region. Uh, where there is no spinal cord area. But yeah, no, I have done uh, uh, trials where we have to enter at the T11-12 inter, uh, interlaminar space. Now, now you know, I apologize for the uh, the brightness of the uh, flow that we changed over to the just viewing the monitors. Unfortunately, I'm getting a lot of. So, Glenn, yeah. Glenn, hi. This is this is Mario. Can I ask a quick question? Please go ahead. Regarding the spinal cord simulator, if you have to enter at the higher level, or if the, um, uh, you know, hardware is in is in uh, position that makes the. Uh, you know, placement a little bit more difficult from the technical point of view. Of course, you, you mentioned that you can go higher up at the T11-12 thoracic spine level, but theoretically, you could ask a surgeon to do the trial for you, right? That, that is exactly true. Uh, a, a paddle trial can be done uh, where the, uh, the surgeon can uh, place a paddle temporarily, have the patient uh, uh, either on uh, some uh, monitoring anesthesia care 
where they're awake and talking to, to us and seeing, well, where do they feel the paresthesias? And then once that is established, they can move forward with the implantation. But yeah, that's very much true. A, a paddle uh, lead trial can be done by the surgeon. Right. And then uh, regarding the dorsal root ganglion simulation, I saw a question that was put to Ramo by one of the UCSF fellows about the utility of uh, a transforaminal epidural steroid injection or the whether or not the transforaminal epidural steroid injection, successful transforaminal epidural steroid injection can be predictive how successful the dorsal root ganglion simulation can be. And Ramo's response was uh, the... Uh, trial is the indication of whether or not the dorsal root ganglion simulation is going to be successful or not. You don't necessarily need to do a transforaminal epidural steroid injection to begin with. I just wanted to, and I asked this to Ramo uh, personally, but the question is, how about doing a transforaminal injection with local anesthetic to identify the potential nerve roots where you want to place the dorsal root ganglion simulator if there is doubt of whether the location of the appropriate placement could be. Getting my microphone on. Can you hear me here, Mario? Perfect. Yes, All yes. Right. So yeah, so great. Um, I'm glad you're bringing this up. So you can absolutely do the transforaminal for diagnostic purposes if you really need to understand which dermatomes are affected for that patient. But what I wanna make very clear is that that local anesthetic injection is not prognostic. It's not. Right, and, and, and that's exactly what I wanted, the point that I wanted to stress, that you mentioned that uh, doing a, a successful TFESI is not indicative of how, of how successful the DRG implant would be, but if you have to decide whether you have to place the lead at L2 versus L4 or L3 versus L4, you, you can do a diagnostic injection first, even though L3 and L4, you may end up having to place two leads at two different levels at the same time. And what I mentioned in my chat box was that uh, there is some work, uh, you can look at some of the literature out of, out of Germany and also here in the United States of using pulse radiofrequency ablation as a prognostic uh, indicator yeah, for success. I saw that. Thank and, you, Ramo. And Thank as you. we know, the pulsed RF doesn't get reimbursed in the United States, so many people end up doing pulsed to begin with and then injecting through that to bill for your transforaminal, um, kind of right. getting back to what you were saying. And so you'll get that diagnostic portion from the local anesthetic, and then the pulse RF will tell you if there's going to be a therapeutic benefit. Great. Thank you, Ramo. Thank you, Mario.